What's up, everyone? Welcome into Dodger Heads, presented by DodgerBlue.com, your home for the 2020 World Series champion Los Angeles Dodgers. My name is Jeff Spiegel. I'm joined by our prospect expert, Justin Lorber, a.k.a. Future Dodgers. We are here. Yes, we're recording this the day before the trade deadline, but Justin is on the verge of releasing his mid-season prospect update, and so we wanted to check in with him. Justin, I know the draft is your favorite part of the year. I imagine trade season is another fun one for you, learning about prospects from other teams, but also putting your your knowledge about our farm system to good use. Is that a fair uh, assessment there? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, not fun to lose guys that you like, but other than that, yeah. Do you have, I'm just curious. I, I didn't prep you for this. Do you have a particular trade where the Dodgers sent out a prospect that was like just a personal favorite of yours that it just hurt regardless of who is coming back on the other side that you were just personally hurt by it? Yeah. The Tony Watson trade from 2017. Uh, O'Neal Cruz was my boy. Uh, that, that was sad. And, you know, it, there were a lot of other guys that could have moved in that deal. He was not, like, a highly rated prospect at that point. And I loved him just because the fun of having, like, a 6'7 shortstop who could hit. But now he's a, he's a top 100 prospect. He's a legit, you know, high-end prospect. And, yeah, that, that 22 one 22 years old. Very Fair enough. Yeah, and it, and it always hurts when it's like for a reliever. I mean, the Jordan Alvarez trade is the other one where I'm not saying anybody knew who how good he was, but when you remember that you got Josh Fields back. And look, Fields was a competent reliever for the Dodgers for multiple years. I'm not like a pro Fields guy or an anti Fields guy, but it hurts when it's like, and we got Tony Watson back or or Josh Fields. So, anyways, that's not the topic of conversation today. We're talking prospects, and so Justin, let's start with some guys that are about to be added to your list the Dodgers signing prospects they've done a really good job I believe last time I checked I think it was their first 14 draft picks maybe it's 13 draft picks have all signed so what's the latest on the Dodgers and and their draft picks and signing them yeah so I I think you had it right the first time they have signed every pick from rounds one through 15 they didn't have a second rounder so that's their first 14 picks Still unsigned, our 16th rounder, Michael Sirota, prep shortstop from Connecticut, committed to Northeastern. Uh, based on Billy Gasparino's comments at the time, it didn't seem like he would be, you know, very signable. And now, you know, with the Dodgers being right up against that 105% threshold on their bonus pool, which no team has ever gone over under this current system, and they almost certainly aren't going to go over. Uh, unless he's going to take 125000 and I don't think he would, at least based on Gasparino's comments, doesn't seem like he would. He's probably going to school. Adam Tolich, uh, lefty from West Virginia. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why he hasn't signed because he's 21. He's, you know, junior age. Uh, he's been pitching well in the Cape Cod League. Uh, a lot of guys who, you know, had some time in between the end of the college season and the draft went to the Cape Cod League, even though they were draft eligible. It's not usually how it works, but with the draft being pushed back, they were able to go there. Some guys actually probably moved up because of their performance there. He's been pitching well. Uh, maybe he would go back to school because he just turned 21. So next year in the draft, if it's June or uh, or if it ends up being in July again, he'd be almost 22 or just having turned 22. So maybe he doesn't sign. I would still expect him to. And then Charlie Connolly, the 20th rounder from Navy, um, he has his naval service to fulfill. I have no idea if this means he can sign and they just hold on to him or if he can't sign. I honestly don't know what's going on there. Uh, but yeah, it, they're basically done, maybe except for Tolich, a 17th rounder. Uh, and, you know, they've made everything else work with their signings. They've gotten, you know, just about all the guys that I think you would expect. Yeah, and you to. pointed out they basically have maxed out their, their bonus pool, which is why Sirota seems so unlikely, because they don't have any money left. It's always such an accounting exercise to figure out how it all works. But most people have them either basically right at the line, you know, they get the extra 5% buffer, they're, they're right about there. There's not a substantial amount of money to make any of this work. So with all that said, with all these guys signed, talk me through where do these guys end up? I mean, the, the high schooler with their first two picks, right? So where do those guys head to? And, and I'd also be curious, as you're putting together your rankings, I know you're not totally finished, but a guy like Maddox Bruns, where does he fall in your rankings? I have Bruns and Hubeck, uh, the third rounder, both in the teens, mid-teens, um, pretty close. I've right now on this draft that this should be out next week. So these might move a little bit, but as of right now, I've brunched just a couple spots above Quebec and they're close. They're not super far apart. Uh, 
you know, if Bruns were to go to Arizona, uh, pitch, at, you know, at Camelback Ranch in one of the complex lead games and just throw a bunch of strikes, that would move him up. For now, you know, we don't know if that's going to be the case. We don't know if any of these guys are even yeah. going to pitch uh, yeah. this year. A lot of them had full college seasons after not pitching, you know, full time last year due to the pandemic. So a lot of them won't pitch. One guy who I think could is Nick Nestrini, the fourth rounder mm. from UCLA. And that's because he didn't throw a whole lot of innings this year. I think he threw like 40 innings total between his time at UCLA and uh, his time in the, uh, I think it's the California Collegiate League, something like that, um, after the college season, but before the draft. So something like 40 innings. I'd be interested to see if they pitch him because of that. But guys like Ben Kasparius, Emmett Sheehan, the fifth and sixth rounders, those guys were starters who pitched full yeah. college seasons. I would guess they get shut down. Maybe Bruns and Hubeck get shut down. I don't know what their you know high school workload was like or what it compares like to last year. My guess is we don't see a lot of these guys until now. I was going to ask you about position players, and then I realized that the Dodgers didn't draft any position players <laughs> until the very end of the yep. draft. So, yeah, one position player, the guy from Cal Baptist. So shout out to Cal Baptist. He signs. Um, real quick, last one on Bruns and Hubeck. You say they're in the teens. Just for context for me, who are the other pitching prospects in sort of swimming in the same pond as they are? Is that like Landon Knack territory? Are we a little further down? The, is that like Michael Grove territory? Where do they sit? Grove has had a lot of trouble throwing strikes in double A. Um, he's been had around a little bit too. So he's a guy, and I know we'll talk about this in a little bit, who has kind of fallen in the first half of this year uh, as it as it pertains to value. So I have them below, you know, you got your big three, Gray, Miller, Pepio, and then you kind of have that second tier where I have Jackson, Beater, and Knack, and then I have them below those two tiers. Okay, got it. Okay. Well, let's get into, you mentioned risers and fallers. You're putting together your list. You do a top 100, is that correct? I do, and, you know, I, I write about it, I do it twice a year, and I write about it in every, you know, I call it my rankings primer, but rankings preview, probably a yeah. better word. Ranking 100 guys, <laughs> it is, it's more fun for me than it is useful for other people, at least as you get down to the 50 to the 100 range, because those guys are very close. There's not a whole lot of separation between a guy ranked 61 and a guy ranked 99 yeah. compared to a guy ranked 11 and a guy ranked 49. Yeah. I'm not sure if that math is correct, but I, I think it is. <laughs> so once the further you mo move down in those rankings, uh, the degrees of differences between each spot, between every spot, it just gets exponentially smaller. And uh, maybe at some point I won't do a hundred, you know, I'll do 50 or 60 and then maybe buckets of guys I like who are similar profiles. That's kind of how fan graphs does it. You know, they rank 40, 50, 60 guys, depending on the system, depending how strong each system is. And then, you know, in their annual write up, they just have buckets of other guys who are similar profiles, relievers, uh, you know, power hitters, whatever. And they just talk about those guys and then, you know, here's why they're not on the list, but you know, they, there's something interesting that makes them worthy of a mention. Yeah. I've thought about that. Maybe at some point I will do that. But for now, it's 100. Okay, well, let's get into risers and fallers. We'll start with fallers because you already mentioned a guy that it sounds like might have been on that list in Michael Grove, which is too bad because Grove's the guy I got to interview in spring training. Seems like a great guy, obviously a high draft pick. But who are some of the guys that, that as you're putting together your list, you're finding yourself moving them down in the rankings um, to some degree? With Grove, this stuff has been good. Uh, it's not a stuff issue. He just... He's been getting hit around, and he's been walking a lot of guys. And it's a bad combo. You know, <laughs> yeah, you get you start getting some territory. Well, all right, is this guy a reliever? And that just that changes the valuation a lot yeah. um, from starter to reliever. Uh, I don't typically rank relief prospects very highly; it can vary from person to person. But you're talking about potential value. Those guys only throw so many innings a year. Yeah. And, you know, e even if you'd have a guy who can be a back-end starter, uh, that's going to be more valuable, at least if you're looking at a, you know, war perspective, which I know everyone doesn't like, <laughs> or not everyone likes. But those guys can only have so much of an impact. Okay. And at least beyond the high-leverage guys, like the true high-leverage right. prospects. There are a couple uh, in the Dodgers system. Clayton Beater might be one of those guys. He might also be a starter. Uh, but he'd be someone who... If he's a reliever, he'd still rank pretty highly because it's true high leverage stuff. Got it. As it goes for other fallers, uh, I'll start with another pitcher, another former second rounder, Jimmy Lewis. Yeah. Um, now, I mentioned Grove stuff has been there, but the command has not. 
Lewis, it's kind of been the opposite. Mm. Um, the stuff has seemed to have taken a step back, at least based on the reports that are out. Baseball America just updated their rankings, and they mentioned that he was sitting in the high 80s, uh, which is it's not good. Um, <laughs> he's And he was not like an exceptional pitch data guy either. He was more of a field guy uh, coming into the draft who you'd hope would grow into better stuff that hasn't happened yet. And so, uh, you know, it, it's tough. He has, he's still 20 or he, maybe he turned 21 recently. Uh, so he's still relatively young, but I think you have concerns there on how the stuff will project in the future. And yeah, so he, he's moved down a few spots. Um, some other guys, a lot of the kind of quad A types, uh, Luke Rayleigh, DJ Peters, Edwin Yaceta, those guys have all moved down. Yeah. Um, you know, Luke Rayleigh has been great at AAA. The other two have been just okay. Uh, but seeing them get exposed to a major league level when, when maybe they weren't ready, but they just they weren't very good at the major league level. DJ Peters just kept getting exposed by high fastballs. And in this league, as it stands right now, if you can't hit high fastballs, right. you are going to struggle a lot. We're seeing that with Cody Bellinger right now, a guy who, you know, as recently as two years ago, was playing at an MVP level but struggling a lot with fastballs. There are other issues with him, whether he's fully healthy or not. I think that's a different discussion. But yeah, with Peters, it's tough because that's a hole in his swing. And because of how big he is and he's got kind of a long swing, it's tough to fix. Well, and you look at the age of those guys and it's it's not like you say, oh, they just need more time. They need more seasoning. It's like we're right in the range of when it's sort of like, you know, you're there. Like, it, it, you, of course, you could get better. Yes, but like we're at the age of, you're not a 20 year old anymore. So if you can't do it now, if you're Rex or Rayleigh or Peters and you look, you know, as out of place as you do offensively, that that's tough. That's tough. And and Peters especially is a guy that, you know, you look at the tools, you look at the numbers, you say, man, I really like what I see here. Then he comes up to the major league level and you're like, got it. Okay. This is what we're dealing with here. So um, totally understand that. Anybody else on your, uh, on your falling list? Uh, let's see here. I do like Rex, by the way. Okay. Uh, out of all those guys, I actually like Rex. I think uh, he has the best hit tool out of those three, Rex, Raylian, Peters. Okay. Uh, so I like him. I do think like he can be a bench bat. I have more confidence in him uh, eventually becoming a major league bench bat than I do the others. But he is also the oldest. He's 27. I he's... Yeah, I was like, oh, maybe he's 22. No, he's 27. But yeah. Okay. But I do like him. Uh, in terms of fallers, uh, Sheldon Noisy actually graduated uh, in terms of service time. So he won't be on the probably, list. Probably, probably, probably for the best for him as far as not having to find himself in the fallers category. I would imagine. Yeah, another guy who uh, I I liked him. I, I liked the possibility of the Dodgers potentially helping him out with his swing because he you know he consistently hits the ball hard mm -hmm. or at least uh, before this year he was and uh, just wasn't hitting a lot of balls on the air pull side. And so you said, okay, well if you can get him to pull the ball in the air more, he's gonna hit some homers. And, you know, just really got exposed at the majors, not hitting for a whole lot of power in the minors either, which, it, you know, in the kind of offensive environment with, uh, well, it's now the AAA West, used to be the Pacific Coast League, a lot of offensive-oriented stadiums, and yeah. he just hasn't really hit for that much power. And with where he profiles, uh, you would have hoped to see that, I think. Okay, well, let's look, let's, let's head to the positive side of things. Guys that are moving up your rankings um, based on performances so far this year as kind of, you know, you're looking and, and the the complex leagues, the DSL, those types of leagues um, have started up. So who are the guys trending in the right direction uh, as far as Dodger prospects go? So number one has to be Jose Ramos. And I mentioned him in our uh, yeah. in an earlier show, which I think is going to come out a day or two before this one. He has been really, really good. Uh, got moved up to Rancho pretty quickly. And what's his background? Because uh, he's a name that I'm, I'm guessing most people aren't totally familiar with. So is this uh, age-wise, position-wise, where did he come from? Yeah, so he was signed a couple years ago out of Panama as a 17-year-old. So, you know, a lot of these high-end guys signed at 16, kind of a late bloomer, uh, you know, a toolsy outfielder, played center field for a little bit, probably profiles best in right where he has a plus arm that can play there. Um, and the dude has some massive exit velocities, and he has hit some bombs both in extended spring training uh, in the Arizona Complex League before he got promoted, and already in Rancho. He has two homers and, I think, four or five doubles in six games, 
five out of six games, multi-hit games with an extra base. Wow. Uh, he's been hitting really well. He is someone who I had in like the 60s and he'll be in the top 20 of the update. So he's probably the biggest riser out of anyone on this list. The um, grin on your face, the grin on your face as you're talking about this guy. I mean, I asked about him and it just, it's like the, your face lights up when you're talking about this guy. So that, that's exciting as a Dodger fan to hear how excited you are. Still a young kid. So it's good stuff. Yeah, I've seen some data with him uh, on his exit velocities. It's really good. Love it. Especially Love when you it. consider he's a 20 year old. Yeah. I mean, he wouldn't even be draft eligible uh, yet if he were in the draft. He would be the age of a college sophomore. And he's at high A, you so, said right now? Low A. He just got promoted to low A in Rancho. Um, a couple of exciting outfielders there with him and Jake Vogel, who's been up and down, but better since he returned from about a month long stint on the injured list with an ankle. Another outfielder in the Arizona Complex League, Luis Rodriguez. Some people might know him because he was the Dodgers' big international yeah. signing a couple of years ago. Hadn't actually played before this year because of the pandemic. This is his pro debut. And he has been more than holding his own, I think, right. in the Arizona Complex League as an 18-year-old. Hitting the ball hard, uh, has a couple of homers. Now, he's striking out a lot, but he's an 18-year-old. This is his first you know, real pro experience. What I look at is he's walking 15% of the time it. in that. Uh, so I value walks probably a little more highly than other people might, because I think there are uh, there are externalities there that aren't even captured by stats like weighted runs created plus, which value walks pretty highly. Uh, I think that there's value in having a lineup full of guys who can make pitchers work and draw walks. And of course, we've seen that yeah. in the last few years at the major league level. So he's someone who there were some concerns about his approach um, entering this year. I think he has kind of put those to bed a little bit, at least with how he's performed so far as an 18-year-old facing some older pitching. Another guy, same league, Carlos Santiago, the guy who I really didn't know a whole lot about. Fandrass put out an update last week with him. Uh, it's a 19-year-old, or actually just turned 20. A uh, 20-year-old shortstop, plays both middle infield spots, um, shorter, shorter levered guy. Uh, but those guys are becoming more in style now. The guys with shorter levers who can get quick to the ball and, you know, avoid some of that swing and miss that has become so common yeah. in today's game. Uh, on the pitching side of things, Yermin Rosario uh, has been pretty good. Uh, he was another guy who was part of that Diego Cartayo, Alex De Jesus class from a few years ago. He's been pitching pretty well. Really good breaking ball. And I'm going to throw out a guy who I would almost guarantee – <laughs> no one knows who this is because I didn't know who this was until like two weeks ago. Uh, his name is Edgardo Henriquez. I think I have the first name. I might even have his first name wrong. If well, it is, nobody's heard of him if you messed up his name. That's for sure. He's an 18-year-old. He's 6'4". He's a big kid. Really, really good fastball, breaking ball combo from a data perspective into the mid-90s. Uh, right now, you know, when I heard about this, I you're, was like, you're correct on the How? name, by the way, the Dodgers do have a player named Edgardo Henriquez. Beautiful. Uh, he's got to be the best kept seeker in the org right now. Uh, really good two pitch combo for an 18 year old striking out a lot of guys in the ACL. Yeah, he, he's moved up a lot and he's exciting. Okay. He's excited. And I'm excited to potentially hear more about him because I, like I said, Never heard of him before two weeks ago. So maybe, you know, one of the prospect sites will pick up on him and get some video on him. Another guy you mentioned is Andre Jackson. It seems like he's at least, you know, maybe not one of the quote unquote biggest risers. He's a fascinating what he is moving up your board. Is that fair? He did. Uh, he's moving up about seven or eight spots. So, so help me understand played. that one. He's on the 40 man roster. The Dodgers have gone to Mitch White. They've gone to Uceda. They've gone to they've they've created space for Josiah Gray, who's obviously a better prospect. He is. Jackson's 24, 25. He's pitching well. He's already on the 40 man. Why do you think he has yet to get his opportunity at the major league level? You know, I think it's just order of operations. Um, it, they were more willing to go to the guys who either had major league experience like White or a guy who had already, you know, seen double A like you say to okay. uh, and Gray like you. He's the, he's the top yeah. guy. He's their top pitching prospect. So, of course, if he's healthy, they want to call on him. I, I think you could see Jackson in AAA at some point this year. I probably think they should. Uh, but it, he wouldn't be a guy, and this is probably going to come out after the trade deadline. So 
maybe I'll be super prescient when I say this. I wouldn't be surprised if he got moved for some of the factors that you said. Yeah. He, you know, he's older, he's already on the 40-man roster, so this is already an option year for him. If he's not major league ready, and I'm not sure he is, he might be major league ready at some point in 2022, we know those 40-man spots are valuable. The Dodgers will have to find a couple for the two Corys, Corey Seager, Corey Knebel, coming off the 60-day injured list in just a little bit. So I wouldn't be surprised if he's a guy they ended up moving, not because I don't like him, but because yeah. of some other factors there. And I'll hit just on a couple more risers, Johnny DeLuca, um, moved up at the same time as Jose Ramos when Jose Ramos went from Arizona to low A. DeLuca went from low A to high A, and we talked about him in a previous video. Power, speed, good walk rate, um, 22nd rounder from a few years ago out of Oregon. I know. Yeah, we can't. Boy. I mean, gee, it took you 10, 30 seconds there almost to, to, to mention Oregon. We, that's got to be the lead there, Justin, okay? The lead. Well, he's an Oregon Duck, so... I we have like 100 of them in the organization now. Jake Reed, I don't know if he's still there, but Jake Reed's around. We've got Scherfe. We've got Clevenger. I love it. More more Ducks, the better. Reed got claimed by Tampa Bay, okay. so he's not there. Dang. I, I was hoping for the Tyler Anderson trade for the record, too. I just, like, get them all in there. He, he, how many Ducks are there? There's not very many, but they're all... We're, that's why the funniest part is that the three relievers, all those guys played on the same team. Many people have probably already heard the story, but I think it was like the yeah. 2013 team. That was the group. And I'm like, my brother is a Vanderbilt guy, so he always brags about their baseball program. Our baseball program will never touch Vanderbilt's, but it just cracked me up that there was a moment in which three Oregon Ducks were all on the Dodgers roster. Sorry, I totally derailed that segment there. Johnny DeLuca, 22nd rounder out of the greatest university of all time, the University of Oregon. Please continue. No, that's about it. He's played some center field, played some right field. He's in high A now. Um, more age-appropriate level for him because he's 22. Uh, interested to see how he does there against the more advanced pitching. And I'll just run off a couple more names. Eddie's Leonard and Yorbit Vivas, two middle infielders at low A, both hitting really well, both have added power this year. Um, they have moved up into my top 30. Lionel Valera, another middle infielder. He's at high A, though, who has added power. Someone who I think could garner some interest in trades because he'll be Rule 5 eligible okay. this offseason. Okay. Uh, power, speed, should stay at shortstop. Um, I have him a little lower than I think some other people might because I'm worried about the strikeout rate. It's over 30%. Um, it's a lot of swing and miss. And, you know, worry about those guys with power. You know, the question is, will they get to it? Yeah. But yeah. there are some definite risers in this system. Um, I think the system looks a lot better than it did six months ago because you haven't really had anyone graduate. The you know, most notable graduation was Zach McKinstry. Yeah. So other teams have had graduations. Guys have you know, been taken off prospect lists. Uh, the Dodgers have not, and they've had guys you know, like Bobby Miller show that they were just absolute steals uh, in draft last year, for example. Yeah. So it's in a better spot than it was six months ago. And I think you know, as some of these lower-end guys continue to develop, hopefully, um, you know, they'll continue to keep producing that depth that has allowed them to hold on to their true high end prospects and trade away from some of that depth to get major league acquisitions. Love it. Love it. Well, let me hit you with a couple questions I've got. And we've got some questions we got from Twitter as well. Um, I'll, I'll start with looking at the big league roster. Are there any prospect types who could contribute? I mean, Cabert Ruiz is the obvious answer here. So maybe in the Cabert Ruiz, non Cabert Ruiz division, are there any guys at the triple A level that we haven't seen yet that you think could potentially make an impact at any point in, in the rest of the season? Or have we kind of, have they kind of fired every bullet they had on the, the back half of the 40 man roster or guys that would need to be added? I think the guy who could contribute is Ryan Pepio. Yeah. Probably not as a starter, but as a reliever, I think you throw him in the bullpen with that, you know, plus fastball plus plus change up combination um, and see what happens now. They don't necessarily have to do that. I don't think that they're they're at such a dire need that they would need to add him to the 40-man roster and bring him up. But I think there's a possibility. I think that combination is good enough to be in a major league bullpen right now. Okay. Um, you, you're redoing your list. Who do you have as the number one prospect in the Dodger system, do you think? I know you. It's not, not everything is set in stone yet. I don't know if this decision has been firmly made. But this is a, a conversation that has... All over the place, when you look at various top 100 rankings, you can see where other people view it. I'm going to ask you about Cartaya and Ruiz, Michael Bush in here in just a moment. But is Josiah Gray the number one prospect on your list? Is it Cabert Ruiz? Who do you have in that spot? It's Ruiz. The uh, the added offensive performance this year, 
Um, you know, the guy who can stay behind the plate at catcher and, you know, the value in having a guy, you know, who can be at least average or above average on both sides of the ball at catcher. And of course the age, yeah. uh, all those factors, he's the number one guy. And now reasonable people can differ. I would understand gray. I would understand Bobby Miller. I would even understand Cartaya for people who like Cartaya. And I know at least one person <laughs> pretty notable has Cartaya at number one. So, you know, there's a lot of good prospects in this system at the top. And I think that's the fun part is, you know, we're going to get to a point, hopefully, like we were a couple of years ago, where we had May and Gavin Lux yeah. and Tony yeah. Gonsolin and Hebert Ruiz and Jeter Downs and all these guys at the top of the system who were, you know, peppered across different 100 lists. Yeah. for I, I forget, was, was Ruiz starting the season at number one or was Gray in that spot? Uh, I believe I had Gray. Okay. Let me, let me check here. Yeah, I had Gray number one, Ruiz number two. Uh, just a simple flip-flop okay. here in the mid-season update. Um, nothing that Gray has done. Yeah. If anything, I actually like Gray more <laughs> than I did, you know, four months ago when I made these. Yeah. But Ruiz's performance uh, and the added power has just been, you know, too hard to ignore. So you mentioned Keith Law is the guy who's high on Cartaya. He has Cartaya as the 22nd ranked prospect in all of baseball. For context, that is one spot ahead of Jack Leiter, who many people believed was the best prospect in the draft, potentially, at least the best pitching prospect. He has Cartaya ahead of him. Um, talk to me about how you evaluate those two. Obviously, they're radically different. Ruiz a few years older. Ruiz at a much higher level. Ruiz has actually come up to the major leagues. There's people that think Cartaya has the bigger upside, but he's also much younger, much further away. How do you navigate? Is it crazy to you when you see Keith Law having Cartaya as the number 22 prospect in all of baseball? Or can you get your mind there and say, I get it? It's not crazy. The upside is immense. I mean, as far as catchers go, it's hard to get more upside than Diego Cartaya. Guy who can play good defense behind the plate, you know, heard some positive reviews on how he handles pitchers for such a young guy, and the power and the exit velocities are there. And he's walking a good bit, too, as a 19-year-old in low A. So I, I don't have any problem with him being the number one guy if you value upside yeah. and if you think that there's a reasonable chance he gets there obviously catching prospects there's some volatility there he's still young he's still in low a still 19 uh, but the upside truly is immense and i wouldn't have a problem putting him anywhere from like one to six okay let me ask about two other guys that sort of are floating around the top five uh michael bush start struggled to start the season i believe was battling some injury stuff it feels like of late maybe the last six weeks or so things have turned for him so I'd love to hear what your take is on Michael Bush, where he stands compared to the beginning of the season. And you mentioned Bobby Miller. I'll just ask, what's the ceiling here? Is this a number one? Is this an ace down the road? Is this a number two? Where do you see those two guys as far as how the last couple months have played out? So I'll go in reverse, and I'll start with Miller. Uh, yes, this is frontline stuff. Um, if he were in this draft this year, he wouldn't make it out of maybe not the top five or six, okay. let alone uh, make it to 29 like he did last year. You know, really, really good stuff. You have multiple uh, potential secondary offerings. The fastball is really, really good, mid to upper 90s. And he's shown some pretty impressive commands. So, you know, the upside here is a number one or two star. Okay. Uh, and that's how, far, sure. how far away are we talking? Are we like two to three years down the road? Yeah, I think 2023 would be realistic. Yeah. Uh, he's at high A this year. With how he's pitched, he could pitch a double A this year. I don't think that would be, you know, pushing him too much. So I think 2022, for sure, minor leads, double A, maybe triple A. Uh, I'd say 2023 would be a realistic ETA for him. Okay. Michael Bush, I think, potentially realistic next year. Like you mentioned, he was hurt. Um, I question the lingering effects of that injury. It stemmed from a hit by pitch to his like hand, Not wrist, it. arm area. And you know, if you look at how he's done in May, um, how he's done in June, which so he got hit right at the end of May, missed like seven to ten days with that injury, and then came back. And then you look at July maybe it didn't have an effect on him, but just reading into how he's done in May, which is great, how he's done in June, poor, how he's done in July, best so far, uh, I, I don't think it's out of the question that it was affecting him. Got it. And the defense at second base isn't great. He's not going to be a plus defender. I don't think it gets to a situation where, like Max Muncie, where he actually becomes a plus defender at second base. But he can be passable there. He can play first base. He can play corner outfield. 
Um, a guy who they can move around, a guy who's going to walk a ton. He's going to hit for power. Uh, you know, he might not hit more than like 240, 250, but if he's walking 14, 15% of the time and hitting 20, 25 home runs, that's a really valuable player, especially at second base. Yeah, love it. Okay, let's get into some questions from folks uh, on Twitter. This next, this first one's from Kevin. This might be more of a trade deadline thing. Again, this might be posted post trade deadline, but when you look at your top 10 or top 15, he asks, which highly rated prospect are you afraid of losing? Which highly rated prospect might be you be okay with losing? So another way, maybe the way I think of it is, if you look at your top 10 to 15, is there a guy on that list where you say, man, I'm higher on him than everybody else maybe? I mean, obviously, card you could just go down the list and say, I don't want to lose number one or number two or number three. But is there a guy in there that you're like, you know what, if I have to give up one of my top eight, make it be this guy. And the same side, is there another guy in there where you're like, yeah, I'd be fine. I- I'm lower on this guy than maybe other people. I, I would hate giving up Andy Pajes. Okay. I, I love Andy Pajes. Uh, the, you know, launch angel unicorn, a guy who just, you know, can launch home runs, uh, breaking balls, fastballs. Uh, you know, there's some question marks there. He's a higher volatility prospect than most of the guys in the top 10. Uh, there are some definite concerns about swing and miss. Um I, I I love him. I, okay. I think he's a lot of fun. I would hate to lose him. We already almost lost him once. Let's not lose him again. Yeah. Is my attitude there? And as for the opposite. guys in the top nine who I'd be willing to move, uh, kind of cheating because he's kind of like the he's number eight for me is Miguel Vargas. Okay. And some people might question that because he's a really good hitter who never had power is finally getting to his power this year, 15 home runs, which is I think six more than he had in his entire career mm-hmm. prior to this year. But you know, third base, first base fit. Uh, easier to find those guys okay. you know at a major league level guys who can put up above average offensive performance playing those positions at a major league level um so just from a positional value standpoint he's the guy i'd be most willing to lose because all the other guys are either pitchers or you know they play up the middle positions like ruiz cartaya um bush at second base um andy paje is probably not a center fielder but a plus right field okay Okay. Well, Vargas was another guy someone mentioned, so we touched on him. I'll get you out of here with two more. Um, this is from CHR Lopez. We touched on this a little bit. Promising outfielders in the system. You mentioned a couple. Um, I'll, I'll throw a name out there. If you, if Outman, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. James Outman. Uh, this is a guy at spring training. I remember thinking like, oh, it's just a camp body. Like he's not going to amount to anything. Sounds like he's having himself a pretty solid season thus far. Um, I don't know if there's other outfielders you haven't mentioned already, but um, wants to know if there's any promising outfielders in the system. Yeah, Altman's a toolsy center field fit with some power, some speed. Um, you know, I, I question whether he, you know, becomes anything more than a bench batter or a quad A guy, yeah. but he can get there for sure. And, you know, that's something. Yeah. And outfielders go, the most promising outfielders are at the lower levels of the system. Andy Pajes, Jose Ramos, Jake Vogel, Luis Rodriguez. I'd say those four. Uh, Brian Ward at high A has been great this year. Um, some of the best performance as, you know, hitting performance goes across the entire Dodger minor leads of any position. Yeah. Johnny DeLuca, another high performance guy. Let's see. Um, and then you have the quad A guys, uh, Peters, Rex, Rayleigh. Fair enough. Okay. Last one here. This is from Kerbal Forbin on Twitter. He did ask about Johnny DeLuca. We've touched on him. Um, did we sleep on Gavin Stone and Carson Taylor? Um, guys the Dodgers drafted last year. I, I joked beforehand, Stone is not a guy that has been on my radar. I'm familiar with Taylor, the catcher. Um, but but basically, were these guys underrated? Like, it, it, how, Are they outperforming their draft position from just a year ago? I don't think they were underrated at the time of the drafts or even you know right after their fourth and fifth round picks. But they've definitely outperformed their draft position to this point. Taylor is walking more than he's striking out. He's made advancements uh, defensively behind the plate, which was a big question mark for him. Um, not hitting for a whole lot of power, but, you know, can still get there. And, you know, he's not going to be a power hitter. I think what you get with him is, you know, plus hit tool and, you know, walks a ton, doesn't strike out a whole lot. Gavin Stone, the stuff is really good. has been up into the mid-90s with a good breaking ball, good changeup. Um, I, I think it's starter stuff. Um, he's had some trouble as he's gone later into games, like the second time through the order, but also a lot of these guys didn't pitch full seasons last year. So they're still building back up. The Dodgers have been very careful and deliberate with all their starting pitchers at the minor league level. So 
he's someone who I'm excited to see more, especially if he gets up in, into uh, high A, goes to great lakes, where they typically have TV with every start. Rancho doesn't have a whole lot of TV, so I haven't been able to get a lot of eyes on Got him. Got it. Got it. All right. Well, Justin, we appreciate it. If you are not already following Justin's stuff at Future Dodgers on Twitter, um, this is the guy you need to be following around the draft, around the trade deadline. Uh, as we talk prospects, tons of good information coming from him. As I mentioned, he's got a piece coming out in the next week or so. So check out futuredodgers.com um, for that, his midseason prospect update. It's not just the list. It's, it, there's going to be info in there that I'm sure is going to be worth all of our time. So, Justin, I appreciate your time. Who knows? Maybe we'll have you on for an emergency pod here in the next couple of days if something crazy happens with a trade of prospects coming in or going out. But we appreciate your time. Uh, enjoy the trade deadline. Enjoy the next few days getting ready to push this thing out. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Everybody else, thanks for joining. Check out DodgerBlue.com for the latest details. Again, Justin and I just did a trade deadline primer, so that one is probably already out. If you missed it, check that. We appreciate you. Enjoy the weekend, and go Dodgers. The best team holding a trophy high in the air. The Los Angeles Dodgers, champions of the baseball world.